I had that 50 yards and literally I didn't worry about the, the gyro gun side or anything. I put the cross on his, on his spine and just fire. Hello and welcome to the Blue Skies Podcast. I'm PR Ganapati, your host. Hello folks and welcome back to the Blue Skies. Last week we were chatting with Air Marshal Harish Masand and when we left off the conversation, his squadron, 37th Squadron, was on the eve of launching operations in the 1971 war against Pakistan, the war that liberated Bangladesh. As a young officer in the squadron, he had become fully operational. He had flown some very interesting photo reconnaissance missions over the border in Pakistan, helping the Indian Army and the Indian Air Force with photographs of enemy areas that allowed them to develop their battle plans and to target their operations. Today we'll pick up the threads as the war starts and hear the rest of his experience operating the Hunter during the 71 war. Uh, This episode is going to be a little longer than normal, uh, about an hour, but uh, I am sure that you'll find it engaging enough that you wouldn't mind that extra time. Uh, welcome back to the program, I'm Ashil Masan. Thank you, Gans. Pleasure being with you. So coming to when operations commenced, uh, you know, your attack on Tezgaon airfield and being bounced by the Sabres, just put us in the cockpit with you that day. Uh, you know, that's what we want to do in this program is really have people sit on your shoulder and ride along with you. So just love to hear about what that sortie was like in as much detail as you have time for today. Well, I'd love to fly that sortie again on the sim. (laughs) I'd love to fly again, (laughs) you know. But yeah, I remember that 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 was a very memorable, one of the memorable sorties, the first sortie of the war for me, first first exposure to combat and and guns firing at you or whatever. Um, So I remember it very, very vividly, wrote some articles I'll send you and you can attach them. I called it the 4th of December. Yeah, so uh, third evening, you know, when they attacked on the West, I mean, we were kind of told that next morning we'll be going in first thing. So uh, we were, Supi and I were four aircraft mission. We were the first mission, 501, I still remember the call sign, uh, mission 501 and Supi as number two, number one. Uh, there was a flight club from Billu Sangar who was earlier in the squadron again attached from, from in, uh, uh, instructors. He was an instructor in between and attached from the training academy back to the squadron along with Konde and, and another guy called KB Menon. So Billu Sangar was the number two to Supi Maski. Maskaranis was the number three and I was supposed to be number four. And uh, uh, RTOT was uh, 705. Indian Standard Time, 6.35 Dhaka time, East Pakistan time, over, over Tezka. And um, sunrise was about 5.30, 5.45, uh, Eastern time, if I remember, 30 or somewhere there. So we, we were briefed early in the morning in dark in Desops, the entire lot. And I still remember, if, um, I, I used to run an old, I mean, I had a new, Ambassador those days, but it had run down by the time it survived those two, three years in Hasimara. It had been used by everybody. So we were all youngsters who gone in as ambassador to the base ops and, and uh, briefing. And as we came out of the briefing, now we had to rush to the squadron and, and you know, make uh, get our maps and get things going before we went to the aircraft and dispersed location. And I found a flat on my ambassador. Oh. <laughs> so we started... You know, Quickly, quickly walking, rushing to this, literally running. Base ops was like a, 
about a kilometer plus from from the squadron incidentally for this person so we kind of all of us were kind of literally uh, rushing you know walking fast towards the squadron when the CNG and, and I, I must bring this out because it showed how how closely knit we were there was a wing commander Dudley Gomes who was the uh, chief technical officer CTO we used to call it and he was coming by in his jeep behind us and he said oh, what happened to your ambassador Harish so I said so flat so all right jump in I'll drop you in the squadron and he said give me the keys I'll have your car recovered I said there's no point sir because the spare uh, the step knee or the spare wheel had also been stolen earlier in one of the clubs Calcini club in <laughs> oh, so there's no spare wheel in the car he said no worry just give me the keys and by the time I came back from the first sorry the car was parked in front of the flight commander's office with a chit on the windshield under the wiper to say use it as long as you want right at least till the war is over and even after that oh sweet that is amazing and we put a spare wheel he chained the wheel and put a spare wheel there so how oh, that's that's how close we were in Hasimara, you know with all the branches accounts logistics and and uh, technical or whatever so anyway so Supi and I uh, so 6 30 uh, 6.30 local time, Indian standard time was our takeoff for 35 minutes trying to do this go. And when we started up, Supi's aircraft uh, didn't start, so he jumped into the standby. My goodness. And Maskey's, air, Maskey's aircraft, you know, we had those, uh, those days, the Hunter had this peculiar problem of uh, what we used to call IPN4. There was a, there's a nitrous fluid which used to be used as a starter fluid. Sometimes that didn't work, you know, whatever. Oh, boy. So... So Maskey's aircraft also didn't start. And so we were three aircraft finally. And we so I I took over Maskey's place as number three. Mm-hmm. In behind and took off. Uh, my undercarriage won't go up when I pressed the button after I took off. Oh my. <laughs> so these two aircraft were accelerating away from takeoff with 360 odd knots, which they were cruising at, and I was at as 230 or 30 knots was the limit for the undercarriage, if I remember correctly. So I was at 230 struggling behind him and punching this button. There was an electrical button in the in the aircraft for raising the undercarriage and then boom go off. And these guys were going far ahead of me. And I turned with them and then kept kept them in sight. Luckily, December, this visibility was great. And I could see them were miles. But finally I took a no- decision. There was an override button in the in the aircraft on the right side in the combing. Um, which you could use to raise the undercarriage, but that was only meant for extreme shall I, operational conditions because after that, there was no guarantee of the undercarriage coming down, right? If you raise it through that. Wow. When, because of the war, I just took the chance and I said, forget it, I'm not going to leave Sophie and Bilu, two aircraft in South Paul going alone. Correct. And, and I didn't want to miss the sortie also, let me honest. <laughs> I didn't think, to be honest, I wasn't thinking. You know, uh, at that age, you don't think, you just did it instinctively. So I the undercarriage, caught up with them, and we went along. Sorry, we you know, can I just ask you, um, you know, as you were starting up, was there nervousness, fear, excitement? What was uh, going through your mind, emotions-wise? That's the best part. You know, the first sortie, uh, because you hadn't tasted war, there was only, there was only, shall I say, you were looking forward to what's going to be. So there was no fear, there was no nervousness. Uh, everything was as per you were trained and you you didn't and you because you were ignorant and young and ignorance is a bliss sometimes that you 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 kind of didn't have any fear of what is going to come quite frankly you just just went and um, luckily because you know after a few sorties then you realize the shall i say what could happen so you cater for it and you start you know um, but let's say let's say in the first sortie, it was just kind of, oh, it's fun. We're going. Right. All right. Finally, finally we're going to do something that we've been trained for. Right. And Some pilots say that the primary emotion is, please, God, don't let me screw up. Yeah, you bet. Even that wasn't there because the fear wasn't, you know, there was no such, because the moment like you, if you play a game and if you worry, start worrying about these kind of things, you know, don't, don't let me screw up. Don't uh, uh, let it go wrong. I hope I don't get hit. I hope, whatever. The moment you start worrying about so many things, uh, actually you you start screwing. Right. You know, 
like in a game of golf, if you if you think of twenty thousand things before you hit the ball, you will hit it wrong or whatever. So actually, it was just blind, you know, mindless. Just go as you go trained, and so there was nothing. There were no emotions. There were no feelings. There were no fear. Immediate. I mean, at that moment, the only concern was my undercarriage is not going up. My landing gear is not going up. Right. So I got to get it up. I can't let them go alone. I mean, it's not fair. Yeah. I'll miss up. That is all you were thinking of, really. And uh, you won't believe it. Even in the sorry, when I caught up with them and I went to Brest to City on the left, I remember about fifteen hundred to thousand yards, which was the correct position. And Dilu Sangha was in fighting position with Sophie on the right. He's right. Uh, we are cruising along now. Right. And I was. What altitude were you at at this point? Hugging the deck, hundred feet, fifty feet, seventy feet, somewhere. Holy cow! Just just hugging the deck, absolutely very long. I mean, I I still remember. That's why I'm saying uh, the weather was great. Fourth of December, early December, cool, lovely morning. And as the aircraft flew across, we could see uh, women in the field, uh, kind of as they heard the aircraft, grab their children and and run as if we're going to hit them or something like that. Uh, so you could see their faces. You could I mean that close, and you could see everything on the ground, and you're watching around and clear blue sky is beautiful. Uh, earlier there was a haze layer till about. Uh, Tura or some place where the hills end, and then we get into the plains of of Bengal, um, East Bengal. So I still remember there was a slight mist sort of a thing over the hills, and after that, so we were just on the top of the mist, and later we were uh, hugging the deck, literally pretty low. So and we're watching the scenery. You won't believe it. We're watching all sides, looking around for any aircraft, and watching. These women on the ground. I mean, picking up the children, scared. I mean, that impression is still in my mind. I, I still remember how this woman picked up a child and looked up towards the aircraft. You know, that, that face is kind of not clear, but that impression is in my mind even today. So we went across and you know, cruising along like this. Uh, total IT silence. Nobody's talking. And um, about. At IP initial point, I mean that's about two two and a half minutes away. It was about, if I remember correctly, it was fifteen twenty nautical miles north of Tesla. Uh, around there, as we were accelerating to four hundred twenty knots tactical speed, uh, I spotted two sabers on the right, about four five miles, five miles, dead three o'clock on the right, you know, and turning in a in a gentle right turn, as if they were being guided by a radar on an interception, mm -hmm. literally. Right. We we were we were told that they had a um, uh, low low looking radar called AR one in in Dhaka, and uh, obviously they had moved it north somewhere further north because they expected most most of the raids from there. We don't know its exact location till the end of the war. Uh, so this radar must have picked it up and guided these two aircraft which were in patrol. They were in fighting also, and they were coming along. If I can you know picture from the right and a gentle right turn. Three o'clock to us, and so I reported that to Supi. Uh, you know, two sabers on the right, and so on, so clock and distance. And slowly, the sabers in a gentle right turn. The lead saber fell behind. Supi called at about two thousand five hundred yards or so. My goodness! And the tail saber went behind me, and I could see him in the mirror all the time by weaving around a little bit, perhaps at you know three thousand yards or maybe a little further than that because he was training. And in as I reported, Supi, you know, because we were going um, 180 nautical miles way beyond our range, um, and had no combat fuel, uh, command had uh, ordered us not to get into a fight with the sabers. And they said that two MiGs will from Guwahati will come and meet us over Dhaka to make sure that while we are attacking, uh, they look after the sabers. So we were not supposed to entangle with the sabers at all. Mm -hmm. um, that's what you know, and if you were bounced, then you just to do a hard turn and get up and go home. Right. You know, and turn around by 180 degrees and come home. That was the order because we had no gas. Uh, so Supi so started, uh, I think, uh, calling up the uh, the sabers. I think he wanted to say mix here. I think one of his friends, uh, who was called Young and Handsome Y N H Behel, I think was the name, uh, which I learned later. But he's saying Y N H, where are you? And Vyanet would say, "Supi, where are you?" And this "Where are you?" was carrying on between them, but with no effect because you know they were hitting 
<laughs> they were reaching tails down and we were short of tails down so they were just reporting positions to each other somehow but nothing was happening and in the meantime the sabers were kind of creep again and without realizing i think from 420 north uh so we had probably gone to throttle and i had to keep up with them i had uh, increased the rpm also because i was best of it uh we had hit some 480 knots by then okay and uh, at that time the sabers realized i think that they weren't catching up this guy was still hanging around at 2000 yards behind so we as i estimated uh, the guy who was behind so and uh, suddenly there was a whoosh, a white whoosh under his belly. What he had done was dropped his tank, I think. Right. There was a fuel spray of fuel, actually. Right. But at that time, I thought he had fired a missile because we had some reports that uh, they were carrying um, the Sidewinder missiles, they were had been modified and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I thought he fired a missile. And uh, therefore, I immediately ordered a hard drive because that was the uh, standard tactics to get out of a missile shot. Though at low level, it wouldn't have hit him. But even then, I, right. I immediately ordered a hard right Zupia and called myself uh, some 7, 8 G. I don't remember how much. We hauled a lot, you know, and turned towards them, uh, the Sabre. And the Zupia and Belu turned. And uh, when I crossed, uh, say, um, 90 degrees, that means right behind Sophie after 90 degrees of the turn, 70, 80, 90 degrees of the turn. I told him, cutting inside, look out for me, or whatever they call. But, uh, and then rolled out on 350, which was the course home, expecting that they would be on my left breast again. Right. And the Sabre, in the meantime, when, as I went to through 90, 70, 80, 90 degrees, broke off from Sophie because he would have got sand. If he had continued behind Sophie, then he would have come in front of me. So... Uh, you know, he would have got sandwiched, so he turned off and uh, broke off away towards me and didn't see him after that. I rolled out. Well, when I rolled out on 350, which was the course home, I didn't see anybody on my left. You know? So I, oh. I looked around from, from uh, 10 o'clock to 7 o'clock left all the way, you know, glanced around. Up. And then I picked up two, say, two hunters at about 8 o'clock. Uh, facing, if I was on 350, I would say that their course, if you can imagine, would have been uh, 27280, about 90 degrees to me, right? About oh, 80. Wow. So they were kind of facing away from me. Heading uh, westward. Heading westward. Two aircraft in fighting, literally like Sopi and Bul Bilu were. And, um, and turning right, but very gentle turn. It was not a hard turn. It was like a 60 degree bank, 2G turn or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's it. And there was a saber behind them at about three, four hundred yards, and I could see uh, puffs of black smoke from his nose, which meant, oh he, which meant that he was firing. So I yelled, uh, saying, "So please, firing at you! Turn hard!" And immediately, instinctively, I yanked left into an upward turn, uh, looking for the saber behind me at the same time, you know, and all that very, very things going on. So I turned left, and. Um, uh, thanks to Dave Debra and uh, Malik uh, Gupta's training, fell behind the saber like you, you wouldn't believe it, a very one smooth move. Left turn, reverse right, and I was at very high speed, 480 or knots. Right. Uh, so, and these guys were at, I would say 250, 270 knots, somewhere there. Very, very low speed. So, I was catching up very rapidly with them. I fell behind him, the saber, mm -hmm. and um, into a gentle right turn as a walk. And 400 yards with uh, closed in rapidly and uh, with my with my paper, you know, there's there a gyro gun sight in the hunter, which we used to do ranging, tracking scenarios and on, taught very well by these guys. My paper on the cockpit, uh, the saber encompassed by the diamonds around, the correct range, correct everything. Great firing conditions. And sons, you won't believe it. You know what I did? I pressed the camera. Oh my goodness. Wow. So... Training, because, you know, this is what you do in training. You took a film of a, of a guy in mock combat. And That's uh, right. So instinctively, I just pressed the camera button. Said, oh, shit. You know, then I cost myself. Lord, did you realize or did you think your guns had jammed? Or no, no, no. I pressed the camera button and realized immediately. <laughs> okay. I realized that I pressed the wrong button. The trigger was in the front. Camera button is on the left with the thumb. You know, right. On the stick. So... I, I cursed myself, oh shit, and 
and then then load the trigger and quickly you know uh, by then i closed into something like 50 yards behind this guy holy cow that is almost ramming him i'm literally i'm mean, so close now and when i was around 150 100 yards or just below or whatever this guy from a right turn reverse left obviously the saber behind me must have called him up and said, hey, this guy is coming behind you, somebody is coming behind you, so break left or whatever reason he must have given him. So this guy tried to reverse left. I had that 50 yards and literally I didn't worry about the, the gyro gun side or anything. I put the cross on his, on his spine and just fired. Okay, with the right. And you won't believe it, I was so close because as I pressed the trigger, he blew up. Um, my four guns, which had a rate of fire of 20 rounds per second each, uh, Total, when we came back, uh, there was a flight sergeant, Chiefy Chaudhary, as to call him. Very, again, very, very close, very fond of him. Uh, he told me, he said, sir, you fired only 18 rounds. 18 rounds total or per gun? No, total. Holy cow. So four rounds to five rounds per gun, you know, in that quarter second burst. Because he was so close, I could have thrown a stone and got it. <laughs> Literally. So... You know, he blew up, literally, I mean, kind of zoop went. I sent you a picture, you'll see how, how big the explosion was. And that's the, yeah. only, that's the only frame I got out of these guys. And I immediately kind of... Did you fly through his debris? You must have, because you were so close. Oh, so I was so close that he, he literally, it was like a car collision where the guy in front stopped dead. Because the moment I hit him, he stopped dead and the debris started flying outward. Because he... Yeah. And I flew the center of the explosion, I think. My goodness. Center. So it didn't get a scratch on my aircraft again. You know, I just went through clean, you know, through the center and just flew through. And as, as soon as I got him, because a short burst and pressed the thing, I said, I got him, you know, excitement. And I think YNH, you know, and the mate who is now approaching on top, he said, yeah, I see him. Uh, he's ejected. Finally. And he, Anyway, I went into, as soon as I flew through his explosion, I went into a, I told Sopi because I thought he was still in front, right, being shot at. And uh, uh, I said, hard ride, Sopi, and, you know, roll out on 350 back home. So trying to get them, gather them and go on. In the meantime, actually, Sopi had already gone on. I'm sorry to say. They lost me. Right. They had some RT problems or whatever. Uh -huh. And we flew. Much later, I realized when I came back on the ground. So I rolled out on 350 again. Cutting inside these guys' turn, thinking they would be turning. And back on 350, there was nobody again on either side of me. And I just looked around for the saber that I was supposed to be behind me. Yeah, I was wondering what happened to that guy. No, in this melee, I lost him for a short while. And then I just kind of high speed 350 for half a minute or one minute. I didn't have gas. Now I knew I was running out of gas. And I zoomed up to some 15, 17,000 feet with that high speed. And went to 360 odd knots, the range speed or whatever, mm -hmm. and headed right. back. Because I tried to call Sophie a couple of times, but there was no reply from him. I didn't understand what was going on. Uh, when I landed, I realized that he said he had, his RT had packed up, so he could hear me, but he couldn't call me. Right, so he had told everybody that I had I had shot the saber, but he couldn't tell me anything, and we had lost each other. So Bilu and Sophie had landed before me. Wow. But they knew that you had uh, shot somebody down. Oh, I did heard and he'd already told the whole squad. Oh, wow. So as he got into the response, he told the whole squad and the cup and cup and saber. In the meantime, when I landed, after I landed, uh, Chiefy Chaudhary was very excited naturally because I was one of his boys or favorite <laughs> adjutant or whatever. And literally these people, you know, immediately kind of told me about this gun. He looked at the tank when he filled up and later and told me, he said, sir, you know, how much gas you had left, how much fuel you had left, literally fumes. I had nothing left. My goodness. I mean, I couldn't have gone around. I couldn't have done anything. But fortunately, from the height, I mean, the kind of this fault on the, I think, reciprocal runway, I landed once, you know, and, you know, instead of uh, 09, instead of 27, and, and, and uh, just taxied back as long as the engine would last. And switched off with nothing, literally, fumes and Literally on a wing and a pair, done. So it's in my time. Uh, late, so these men then, you know, Nanda Karyapa was the squad leader, or flight commander. I mean, not flight commander, he was CEO of the HU squadron there and acting as the, as the uh, 
deputy operations officer or whatever under uh, R.V. Kismat Singh, Ringamana Singh. And um, so he came in his jeep and kind of tried to pick me up. But these men actually carried me you know, on their shoulder and to the, to the flight commander's office and, you know, cheering me up and see if he was leading them. Ah, that's like a scene straight out of Top Gun. Yeah, something like that. You know, it was so touching, really, all the men, you know, cheering me and carrying me. It was the first kill of the war, first for the squadron. Fantastic. Good one. So later I pieced together that actually the, the two hunters that I saw were not Supi and Billu. It was uh, Squadron Lele and uh, Flying Officer Buster Baines, SS Baines from 17 Squad. Because Buster was the guy who was shot with some 52 bullet holes he had in him. And he heard my calls. And then I got him and things like that. And then the firing stopped on him. And uh, he came back to 17 squad and this person and told everybody the cup shot the saber behind me. And uh, then I pieced it together. And in hindsight, you know, that somewhere in this hard turn, uh, Lele's formation was supposed to be uh, two minutes behind us. Obviously, they must have caught up with us in time. And they must have been closer than two minutes. And when we did the hard turn, they kind of flew under us or something and I was looking for the saber so I didn't see them go by. Um, they didn't uh, say anything on the RT also. If they'd seen the sabers and this melee in front of them. And um, and the sabers who were behind Supi and things must have uh, lashed on to them. Leaving Supi and he lashed on to this easy aircraft that were going along. And Lele put the, uh, the leader, put the aircraft in I don't know, he was an older squad leader, instead of a hard turn at tactical speeds, he was, I think, turning very gently with two notches of flaps, thinking that's the best turn. Actually, it is not for deflecting a shot. So, uh, he was being shot at, and Buster very faithfully was just hanging around on, on uh, Lele's fighting position as griefed. And got shot in the body. And luckily, wow. Buster came back with, I mean, uh, luckily, the Sabres were not using HE uh, explosives, bullets, or they didn't have it or whatever. And these were solid uh, ball ammo, as we call it. So, Wow, that's amazing. Uh, uh, so Buster's aircraft didn't blow up or anything like that, but he had lost his, he had lost his hydraulics, he had lost his instruments, he had lost his whatever but the aircraft engine was working he was flying <laughs> and he we poor chap he brought the aircraft back and i feel sad that that i mean that rank again buster must have had less flying than me i would say right uh, because he was junior to me but in the other squadron they also didn't get much flying so he for they bring this aircraft in this condition i mean he got nothing not even an award or a mention or anything like that when, when I, I would say under those circumstances to fly an aircraft back instead of ejecting deserves something, right, to a young guy. Yeah. Even unfortunately, that's, that's the degree of you know, war, I don't know. And, you know, but those days as flying officer, were we, I don't think we were even thinking of awards or anything like that. We were thinking of flying and having fun and, and you know, participating and looking forward to just the immediate thing. And nobody ever thought of these big things of what the award would be and what the prize would be otherwise, rewards. No, I think I've heard that from a lot of you is that awards never ever went through your minds and when they came, they were a delightful surprise but not expected. I mean, it's only much later that, you know, as you grow older, that you realize that, you know, frankly, um, I mean, I, I, I'll give you another story within my own squadron. Buster, I couldn't do anything about He was 17 squadron, a different squadron. But uh, we were buddies, we were cosmates, and uh, you know, together for a long time. And um, but there was another guy called Rajesh Lal in my own squad, Lalu Lee, as I used to call him, that name, younger, a year junior to me. And uh, he also did something fabulous, brought an aircraft back when I was leading him. And I had recommended him for for uh, Vayu Sena medal, at least gallantry, if nothing else. 
I even wrote his little citation as the adjutant as to what he had done. But I uh, never heard anything about it after that. So never got anything for that. So that's how it is. So, mm. so you got a Veer Chakra for this particular piece of action, the shooting down of the saber. Even the others, I mean, all inclusive because in my in my citation they wrote about this. Uh, this that I've done FR before, then government house, so of course, all together. I mean, it was not just for one act. I think yeah, it was for everything. Super. Can we come to the government house, 14th of December? What uh, was the setup and how was that sortie? Yeah. Let me give you, uh, before 14th, actually, let's give you uh, this Laluli sortie, actually, if you want to hear about it. Oh, most definitely. I want to hear of everyone. <laughs> okay, great. So, Laluli and I, uh, he, Laluli by then had... Some 60 hours on type, I think, Hunters. He was, because he was junior and, and had come later to the squadron or whatever, less flying. So he had very little flying on Hunters. But, you know, after we achieved um, total command of the air in two days or something, uh, we were taking all these people uh, into, you know, into the war as number twos to just give them some experience, more like flying for range or something. You know, they went and uh, they delivered the armament almost like that. So I'd taken him to, I think, Rangpur or Lalmani Hut in that area uh, for an attack on the brigade headquarters or whatever they'd given us in that area. I don't know exactly where it was. You can check my logbook. But uh, as soon as we finished these attacks and pulled up, Lalmani called up to say that he was losing power and uh, he was not, not able to maintain speed or height. So by then, I think we pulled up to about 3,500 feet. So Lalu is supposed to catch up with me, but I turned around and caught him failing. And um, he had obviously some engine failure inside. We don't know what happened actually. But maybe one of the blades blew off or something like that. But he lost some power. So he was kind of struggling and he wanted to eject. So I told him, I said, you know, Lalu, hang on, we got zero, you know, uh, Martin Baker zero ejection seat with. We needed a minimum speed of 100, 120 knots or something like that. On the I said, hang on, because we were still over Bangladeshi territory and, and didn't know, you know, where he would land up and, and who would grab him, whether the, the Bengalis will, or the Pakistanis would you know, catch him. So I said, come along, you know, carry on till, you know, we cruise along and uh, we'll see. But ejection, wait till 1,000 feet, we'll decide then. So we carried on at the glide speed with max power, so kind of powered glide. In wow. The, mm -hmm. We carried on north towards, towards uh, you know, the idea was to at least cross into our own territory so that he was safe if we ejected. Right. And as luck would have it, when we, so he again asked me in the meantime, you know, where we were flying and the calls were going on between us because I was kind of weaving over him left and right, maintaining my 360, 390 knots, 400 knots. While he was maintaining 230, I think, which was the best light speed mm -hmm. for power drive, while he would get the maximum distance. And uh, I was just weaving over him to keep to keep my speed, tactical speed, just in case. I mean, we knew there were no sabers in the area, but just in case, you know, an odd guy got off from somewhere and caught us looking around behind him. And uh, I remember Squaddy the Bose, who uh, was a senior flight commander by then, and Mr. Pete Bozo. He called up and said, uh, let him eject, take him eject. <laughs> and um, Maski was also flying in some of the missions. So Maski came up and said, let Kapi handle it. He's handling it, right? Kind of shut up, Bozo type, you know. So, <laughs> yeah. so I was handling it. I mean, you know, the point was I had said, I had intended to take Laluli to about 500 feet. And if we hadn't been able to land by then, we let him eject at 500 feet, but within our own. Area. Right. And you were the person on the spot then? No, and then picked up. And I was the person on the spot and there was no hassle. You know, 500 feet ejection is pretty safe, actually. But I told Laluli 1,000 feet, you know, we'll decide. So when we were just about kind of hitting 1,000 or before that, uh, this was in the evening, you know, sun was setting low. On the, we were heading north, the sun was on, literally on 24250, you know, that area, known the horizon by then. 
this is almost about 3 34 in the afternoon. Uh, and I suddenly saw Coach Bihar airfield on the left, you know, it was a short airfield actually. Coach Bihar was just about uh, 1200, 1500 yards actually, if I remember correctly. Wow. Abandoned and uh, not in use. But I saw this airfield on the left, and Coach Bihar airfield also faces southwesterly, 24006, you know, that kind of uh, alignment. And so I was on Laluli's right at that time looking at him when I saw this airfield. And I said, Laluli, Coach Bihar on the left. You think you can put it down there? And he said, yeah, I think I can do that. Wow. He, so he kind of turned gently left and headed for landing with power, right? And he did a, and I was leaving on top of him watching him. He did a wonderful touchdown right at the, on the tumble, you know, the beginning of the runway. So you got to use as much runway as you can get. Yeah. So he really touched down right in the beginning of the runway. Unfortunately, because the sun was in our eyes, I think Laluli was misplaced by about displaced by about 10 degrees to the left for the runway alignment at that time. Oh. So he soon after touched down, uh, within 100, 200 yards, he went off the runway. Oh my goodness. So his undercarriage collapsed, but the aircraft stopped. You know, the undercarriage was lost, but the aircraft stopped beautifully. And, and uh, I saw him, you know, kind of open his canopy and jump out and run. And even though he was outside the aircraft, I was circling on top. I called up, run for your life, Laluli, you know, I still remember in funny way. And the idea was to tell everybody, <laughs> yeah, though he couldn't hear me, I know that. Right. But the others would know what had happened. Exactly. The others knew that they had put it down safely and they'd heard the conversation of Kujbiya. So they would know that he's safe in Kujbiya. And a helicopter came and picked him up. And picked him up. Again, great recovery, I would say. The aircraft uh, could have been patched up and recovered. And it was one of the photo key aircraft that were modified by Cameron. The Cameron C. Amazing. Mm. So I wanted to you know, save that aircraft also. Um, so that, you know, I thought Lalvi had done a lot of done a great job and he deserved the call or some some recognition and I recommended it, but well nothing happened, you know, frankly. No. That's all. So we'll come to the government house after this. Right. Another memorable mission. So give us the setup. What was the uh... so you know by by sixth evening, seventh morning, as I said earlier, um we had already got total command of the air, though. Uh, though nobody was confirming it. Much later, we realized that yes, we had because we never saw an aircraft. As a matter of fact, on fifth morning, after fourth, uh, this uh, this uh, you know shootout, most of the missions got bounced on fourth. On fifth morning, command decided, okay, now we'll fight them in the air. So they launched mm -hmm. four aircraft from thirty-seven, the Supremi and Maski, same formation this time with Billu and everybody. And four aircraft from 17 with the commander uh, Chatrat and uh, his number twos and fours were All four, uh, one after the other. So we were kind of slightly higher so that the radar picks up. And they were kind of slightly lower, hoping that the Sabres would come and meet us in the air. And eight of us would take them on. Mm -hmm. Still at low level, not enough gas. Okay, and four tankers. Now, obviously, they must have seen air aircraft coming and they're not going to send two aircraft to bounce us. Right, and then get right, right, right. So they, uh, they avoided us. So, I mean, we didn't see anything, we just went on the way, shot of tail down, came back, right? And uh, there's nothing to do, so we just came back and nothing happened. So, by sixth, uh, I think uh, the command also realized that this was an expensive way of achieving air superiority by going low level and trying to find the aircraft on the ground and and then getting bounced everywhere, and we lost some aircraft to save us also by. Not from 37 or 17, but from 14 squadron to a couple loss. So um, they resorted to bombing uh, by MiG 21s from Guwahati with M62 bombs, steep glide. They tried it out on 6th and 7th morning, and then they knocked off the runway. Uh, which we should have done from 4th itself, like I said earlier. We just had two days and some losses. Yeah. So by 7th, we had achieved uh, complete air superiority and um, Sagat had, like I was mentioning, Sagat had launched uh, the helicopters across to Silet area, one Gurkha regiment there, which, uh, as luck would have it, their intelligence also failed. They thought a whole brigade had been landed there, uh, only a battalion had been landed there. Right, right. And they locked up two brigades in Silet. So the Pakistani two brigades didn't, didn't venture out. These Gurkhas are also great, I think. They kept them, you know, firing at them or whatever. 
So they, they, these two brigades were out of action completely and they surrendered at the end of the war. Very nice, actually, um, and the way it happened. And by 9th, uh, Sagat uh, had uh, jumped across the Meghna River to the, to the West Bank. And uh, now was, you know, literally oh, from the 9th to the 11th, he kind of literally lifted uh, continuously almost three brigades across, you know, literally. Some, some by helicopter, yeah. some by river craft or whatever, heading for that. Mm -hmm. Because, so I'll come to that a little later anyway. Um, so, you know, by then now, because the army was rushing, from about the 9th, we also, in, from Hasimara area particularly, we were sitting on the ground because we had we had no counter air missions to do, no caps to do, nothing to do, and the most all the aircraft that were available were for uh, supporting the army, but we were not getting any demands really. So we were, mm -hmm. youngsters were sitting on the ground many times we did, right. because we thought we were losing out on the war. The war was passing us by, and we were not getting enough missions really, which we wanted. We were looking forward to it so. Uh, then on, so when we, when we thought that we were literally kind of, the war was ending and uh, there was a, a lovely guy called Major Tripathi, I still remember, who was a GLO in, in Hasimara. So when we were not doing anything, you know, and wanted a mission, we would, instead of waiting in the squadron for him to call us, we would sit in the base ops with him, hoping that he will get a demand and we'll take off from there, you know. So just, uh, you know, for those of the audience who don't understand how this works, so the army would refer a request to Major Tripathi and he then would detail it to one of the squadrons? So I'll, I'll put it this way. See, we had we had by 71 perfected or improved a system called uh, where we had a tactical air center with every corps. Right? That means the Air Force rep was with every corps. Right. And with every brigade, we put uh, what we called uh, a forward air, air controller. And uh, like I said, in 71 particularly, we had surplus pilots all over. So, mm -hmm. So we had more than one FAC in every brigade, I'll put it this way. But we had, particularly every one had a, had a, a power forward air control FAC. From the army side, they would have a ground liaison officer, GLO, at every, under the core, at every base nominated to support that core. <laughs> so he would be their rep on our air bases and we would have, you know, the tactical air center and the, and the, forward air controllers with them and they would commune you know the army would raise the demand and the core would filter it through the tack actually and it would come the demand would come to the base and GLO would get it and then tell us so this was mm -hmm. some pre-planned some immediate you know and things like that so some pre-planned missions which were planned the day before because the army force saw that we had to hit something that they were going to be on their way the next day or some immediate when they met resistance and so we had to react within you know 15 20 minutes of receiving the demand and be over the target within say another 10 15 20 minutes so within an hour kind of the immediate demand would be met based mm -hmm. we had surplus effort so we would sit with Tripathi and major Tripathi is so much senior to us of course but we would joke around and chat with him and hoping that some demand would come and uh, Around there, you know, we were even wondering, I remember discussing it with the party saying, now that the war is ending and the army is getting closer to Dhaka, because they used to give, keep giving us the overt line of own troops, they used to call it flot. Right, for sure. Correct. Mm. So, uh, based on that flot, actually, when we didn't get a demand from the army, sometimes we'd take off and get something beyond the plot on our own. Whatever we saw, anything, targets of opportunity, I put it this way. River craft, right. river craft. Uh, some train mm -hmm. moving or some anything we saw moving, we would go. Because at the end of the day, you know, instead of keeping aircraft on the ground, we just launched a mission. So, um, so we asked him if the army is hitting Dhaka now, how do you intend to take Dhaka? Is there going to be street fighting or what? I mean, how it's going to happen? So he said, yeah, let's see. I mean, we don't know. We've done a para drop on 11th we had done, for which Supi and I had done an FR also. Uh, reconnaissance sortie a couple of days before that. Uh, close to Tangela area, two paras were dropped there uh, in the battalion. And they were also rushing towards Dhaka. So this kind of scenario was being built up and we thought the war had ended almost in a couple of days. I mean, the army would enter 
Dhaka and, and you know that'll be the end of it. The fighting will take place. Then suddenly on 14, 14th morning, um, Supi and three more of us, me and uh, uh, Bozo, Scott the Bozo, and KB Menon. Uh, Supi led us into the base ops for a briefing. And uh, it had transpired that some intelligence had come early in the morning that there was going to be a meeting between uh, the governor, General Malik, uh, Mr. Malik, and the army commander there, General Niazi and the senior advisors and everything in governor's house around noon on 14th. <laughs> we were asked, we were asked to hit them at that time to send a message, psychological blow. Right. So now briefing, okay, fine. This information came. Now you said, all right, where's the governor's house in Dhaka? Can you imagine amazingly? <laughs> where exactly is the governor's house? I mean, so many buildings. I mean, what are we talking right. about? So, Amazingly, can you imagine the base of Sofsa? I don't remember who he was, maybe Tanis or Bombay or someone. I don't remember. And, and Tripathi was there. And they pulled out an old Second World War Burma shell tourist map of Dhaka. Tourist map of Dhaka, my goodness. Put the streets and the layout and World War, World War II vintage. Right? That's, that's when I said the intelligence. Can you imagine that's what we had? So this tourist map came out. And we all looked at it and isolated. Okay, there's the governor's out. Uh, Supi got the copy. I think Supi took the, the map. While we guys had to memorize it because we didn't have any. Those days there were no Xerox copies, <laughs> or, you know. But anyway, we just memorized it and we, I planned, I planned the navigation. We took off and went. So four of us went from Hasimara and four MiGs from, from Guwahati. I think the MiGs are well known because 28 squadron was involved. Yeah. Our own problem, and we come out of Bishnoi and anything. Some of the hunters, uh, shall I say, have not been given the same publicity in this in this particular attack. I'll be honest with you in various. Yeah, no, you always hear of the mix only. Mix, and you don't hear anything of hunters, frankly. I, I think because nobody bothered. I mean, uh, Jagan Jagan in Eagles over Bangladesh does mention hunters. But uh, I'd written a review and he mentioned it wrongly as to what we were carrying and how we attacked. And because he just happened to talk to, to Supi, who was obviously getting a little old and probably forgotten some of the stuff. The youngsters remembered everything. So right. anyway, so anyway, so four mix and four hunter. Now who was, who was before and who was after, I'm not even getting into that dispute is not important really. Particularly since you have loyalties on both sides. Ah, uh, yeah, I commanded 28 also, so I don't know. <laughs> no, no, but really, I mean, it didn't matter who hit first or who. Very, we were one after the other. Very true, very true. I mean, who was, who hit the first or fired the first rocket, who cares? Um, but we were one after the other because there was some BBC report that I haven't been able to place my hands on, which showed the shots of the hunter and the MiG, one after the other, on government. Uh -huh. Now, somebody said it's available and I've seen it, but I haven't been able to lay my hands on it. But it's not important, really. What is important is that there were four MiGs and four hunters. We went, one after the other, around noon, all of us, at right, that time. So, so we took off, uh, Supi and I in the lead pair, and uh, Bozo and KB Menon in the trail pair, but supposed to be 10 minutes behind, I think five or 10 minutes behind us. And so we went across. And Two tanks and um, eight uh, T-10 rockets and guns, of course. Mm -hmm. And we went at 15, 20,000 feet now comfortably at the medium level. And um, over Dhaka, we descended to... The ACAC was thick till about five, 6,000 feet. You know, frankly, effective, the ACAC that they had over there. It was very thick, and even then, on 14. And uh, so we descended to about just over 6,000. So for the audience who are not familiar with the term, uh, ACAC, oh, anti -air. ACAC is uh, air to air, you know, ground to air artillery. Yeah, anti-aircraft artillery. Yeah, AAA as they call it, anti-aircraft artillery. But these are like 40, 60 millimeter, you know, heavy guns that keep doing pump, pump, pump. If people are saying, you know, mm -hmm. they fire at that rate. I mean, they don't fire very rapidly. They're not machine guns, but they fire right. pretty rapidly. I mean, you know, probably. 10 rounds a minute or something like that. But they were Hajar guns, you know, they were a huge number. And the whole sky used to be, in Dhaka, whenever we went there, it used to be kind of full of these black puffs of Akak shells bursting all over. Right. right. Um, 
even on the first day when we went close, we saw it, then later the attack that we did. So, so we went uh, at high level, well above the ICAC range, the anti-aircraft uh, gun range, and descended to about 6,000 feet over the envelope, uh, did one orbit, located uh, the government house correctly, aligned ourselves with the conference hall where we expected the conference hall to be in the middle, with the veranda and the, and the arcade or whatever. And went into these from 6,000 feet, went into these 30, 35 degree dive. You know, very steep, mm -hmm. like eagles right. running out over there. Very steep dive so that we minimize the time within the ICAC level and put our rockets through. I still remember uh, the eight rockets went in salvo. We fired them. Right? That's a new side picture, whatever. But I, I remember the salvos going, you know, the rockets going clean through the, through the, the pillars of the veranda, you know, into that window or the room that was designated as the conference hall. Holy cow. Beautiful, you know, no collateral damage, very pinpoint attack, very good attacks actually. Very proud of that, frankly. Because there was no damage to anybody else. And just wanted to put an, the, the ammunition right there in the supposed conference hall and, and scare the, uh, the people there. I mean, I didn't think we would kill anybody because Unless, unless somebody gets a direct hit from these things. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, uh, then we swooped up and then back again, the second pass we fired all, you know, long salvo of, of guns, or long burst of guns, thank you. So hit that. Oh boy. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we exited north from this attack by turning left. And, and I still remember so clearly, exited at very high speed, so we ahead of me, of course, two, three thousand yards ahead of me because we were going to leave and I was behind. And, um, and hugging the deck at very high speed, close to 500 knots, I would say 480, 500 knots. And uh, to avoid, you know, being hit by ACAC or small arms. And I found the Intercontinental Hotel right in front of me, literally, in that course. Right. And Intercon Hotel, we've been briefed actually that all the diplomats used to stay there, UN people, some of the ministers, and Others, you know, mm -hmm. and it was a kind of a sanctuary because we never hit the intercom hotel. We're not interested really in hitting civilians or even if there were some people there. But you know, I was right. so the intercom was towering over me, uh, above me. Uh, the temptation was so beautiful. I just hugged the deck and headed towards the intercom instead of 10 degree left or 10 degree right and going home. <laughs> I kind of just kind of as if I was going to fire at them, right? <laughs> <laughs> And pulled out at the last second, you know, away from them. And I, I could actually see people in the balconies, you know, with their faces again, you know, that close. And they, so, you know, they kind of had fun with that. <laughs> right. And, and the and so that, that whole sortie is still kind of, um, and the whole mission is very well imprinted even today in my mind, frankly. And, uh, there's a book I've read, which is uh, written by an American diplomat. Uh, in which he talks about the fact that you were so accurate and the intercontinental felt so safe that they would be sitting out of the windows watching your attacks with uh, no fear whatsoever. I think I think we had, uh, you know, that way I'll, I'll say that the Indian Air Force there, um, firstly, we had no intention to hit civilians unnecessarily. I mean, we were not. And the idea was to hit military targets. And, and fortunately, our training was so good that I would say most of us dropped our ordnance like even the bombing mission that Mix did from Guwahati, I mean, 28 Squadron and Bishnoi and, and everybody else, mm -hmm. Manbir Singh and all the others who did it. I mean, look at it from uh, a thin runway, unguided bombs, and they put it on the runway uh, in uh, dark, literally, first one was by night, right? And disabled that runway and then, you know, didn't let them repair and yeah. attack them regularly. I mean, tremendous. I had talked to the kind of accuracy that people showed and Certainly, there was no, th no threat to any of the civilian targets there. Because half, I mean, let's be honest, we also knew that the Bengalis were the people we were supporting. We, were, we didn't want to hit them. And they were not, uh, apart from the military, the rest were all uh, um, Bangladeshis, actually. Correct. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so Intercon. And, and actually, this film, BBC film, that talks about this attack on the government house, which uh, somebody mentioned, I haven't been able to locate it on, on YouTube or wherever. Uh, 
films was filmed i believe from the intercontinental right in i'll try and find it for you yeah i'll be very happy to find it but it just just be a link to my article actually that this is exactly what happened Now you also participated in an attack on the army had moved their headquarters to the university campus and you you wanted to scare them a little bit by showing them we could find them anywhere they were what was that like you can run but you can't hide that's the slogan we had <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so you know the psychological uh, blow that we uh, that we delivered to niazi and malik and, and all those people who to hasten the surrender instead of fighting on the streets over there in dhaka on 14 by the attack on the governor house uh, on 15 supi and i went again and i think some migs from guwahati again uh, because we were told that the army is now the the army units 30 40000 troops uh, to defend dhaka are hold up in the university yeah. so they hiding in that in those building in the university so we we went and hit them there literally sort of conveying the message that we know where you are and if you don't surrender we will get you you know we won't have to get into street fighting but we will get you literally sending the message that you you can run but you can't hide and the university in some sense was where it all started with the massacre of the intellectuals at night in march isn't it ah you're right on 26th of march correct absolutely yeah And so, and you hit them with rockets again, or with bombs this time? No, rockets, rockets and guns. Rockets. And you were flying really low in between the buildings and things like that, I asked. Yeah, 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 absolutely. But once again, we swooped down. First, we swooped down from high level because there was still attack and fall up. At least the hunters did that. Okay, I don't know how the mix carried out their attacks. I don't see. I was not there, but we did. So we and I did from high level in the steep glide. First attack, then we stayed low. Second attack and kind of ran in very low in between buildings mm-hmm. and you know these and they were not very high buildings. I think they were three or four stories. Jesus Christ! Wow. They were not tall structures. They were not, uh, if I remember correctly, I mean, they were not very high. But we were kind of hugging the deck in between them. A lot of fun flying like that. And uh, you know, so yeah, we hit them there. And I think that that was the. the nail in the coffin or whatever you call it because 15 that happened and by 15th afternoon they or 16th morning they agreed to surrender and the surrender took place on 16 so i still have some uh, much later i read you know uh, niazi was asked by diwan and marshal diwan cnc is to like command as to why he surrendered despite having enough troops to to defend dhaka or hold on for many many more days and he pointed out uh, i read it in one of the box uh, he pointed at uh, group captain chandan singh who was with four corps incidentally with sagat attached to him and helped in all the helicopter operations he pointed at his chest on the wing and says this is this is you air force we tried to find a place to sleep and rest and get some but you didn't let us no words to that effect it's the air force that uh, made us surrender right amazing And, and and that message, unfortunately, is not, uh, I would say, clear with with the army and the navy even today. I would say, uh, because we don't understand that unless unless you have uh, command of the air, you can't move on the ground. I mean, today I will talk about command of space. If you, unless you command space, you won't be able to fly or or do anything in, on the surface uh, at sea or on land. so so you have to win command of the air and space no matter what for unhindered operations I mean, otherwise you will have operations which will take casualties which will take losses which will not be able to perform at certain times or days or whatever but if you want the freedom to move and, and um, operate the way you want to with impunity you have to have command of the air and space yeah and by establishing that in the first few days i think you gave the army so much flexibility and uh, of course brilliant generals on the ground like general sagat singh exploited that you know quite frankly without that without that air superiority i mean you couldn't have 
concluded the whole operation in those 10 12 days and in that difficult terrain uh, it was this this whole operation we call a lightning campaign blitzkrieg after the you know second world war uh, the way the germans fought initially in in the low countries and um, well yes it is but it's because of the the F, the command of the air and that's that's how you could move so fast and and i wish i wish you know this Bring me to joint planning again, you know, the coordination between services. If you have a few minutes, I'd like to touch upon that. Uh, I mean, at that time, we thought we were operating very coordinated and well, because we only dealt with the GLO. Right. And, but as, as we analyzed, as I grew up in service and I analyzed this whole thing, I realized that actually we were working on silos. One, because if we had... Um, if we had sat together from March, April, when the whole thing started, and, and everybody had understood that in the East, command of the air or complete air superiority was a given. I mean, with, they only had one squadron, they couldn't reinforce it because they couldn't get any more assets right. over there. So, and we had some 10, 11 squadrons out of which two were taken out very quickly. A couple of them were looking after... Uh, the likely or possible threat from China, so they had to stand by and on readiness for in case they intervene, etc. But even if I take out all those assets, uh, at least seven, eight squadrons, seven squadrons, I would say, against that one, right? We had that kind of force. Why? So, so fought well. I mean, we could have, we, we should have been able to ground, and if we had bombed the runway, the only two major airfields that they could operate from, Al Almanirat and the others, were satellite airfields. We could have bombed them also, uh, which we did. Uh, well, we could have grounded the Pakistani Air Force in the East and I would say in the first two hours, if we'd done it correctly. Mm -hmm. and the first, first wave or two waves maximum, we could have done it. So, air superiority of command of the air was a given. Everybody should have known that. Then the army should have said, all right, if air superiority, then I have the freedom to move. Well, can I have more bridging equipment? Can I have more helicopters? Can I have more uh, paradrops or whatever? Right, so that I move quickly. I don't get into frontal assaults. I, I, I move quickly and go to the center of gravity, Dhaka, and capture the, the whole area. Instead, uh, I think in October, November, really, or maybe even during starting the war, uh, from what I read, our our military objective in the east was only to liberate a large portion of of East Pakistan, so that the Bengali government could be put in place there and the refugees could be sent back. Dhaka was never an objective, right? It is because of people like Sagat who took the initiative during the war that, and, and then the paradrop which aided it, you know, from the north, which where Dhaka became an objective as we went along. But um, even General Manaksha, I'm so sorry to say, on that level in army headquarters and not, not planned. They thought Dhaka was too difficult to reach. We couldn't do yeah. it. Or it would take too long or whatever. But we, and Sagat showed how we could do it very quickly. So if we had planned it right in from the beginning, well, Dhaka would have been the objective right from the beginning. And we would have moved in that manner with less casualties, with less losses in the ground and frontal right, shots. If we, had done, if we had done joint planning. Uh, uh, Chief Marshal Lal has written a very good book. I mean, I'm sure you must have read it. That must my years read. in the Air Force, uh, yeah. My years in the IAF. And he's, he's written about these kind of things, about coordination and and personalities and and how we tend to operate and things like that. I think you know when we when we are in a war together, it should be without without question as to who who is the boss and who is not important. What can you bring to the table in terms of capabilities? So we should be sitting together and saying, all right, what can you do? What can you do? All right, can you do this? And then I will do that. And you know, coordinate in that manner. Uh, command. Under command or otherwise, you know, frankly, whether the forces are under command or otherwise, to be able to use the best from each each uh, service in terms of their specialized capability. You know, between you and me, I'm reading uh, a book on 62 by Pallet, Majors and Pallet, DK Pallet. Yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah. Some time ago. And what, what struck me in that was, again, can you imagine? Even for Goa operation, liberation of Goa, where your dad took part, uh, the Air Force and the Navy were kept in the dark till the last minute. 
only the army and, and Menon had instructed that you will not discuss it with the, with the, with the army chief. And the army chief was very happy doing it. Yeah. They never talked to him. Right. Till the end, last minute. Even for China, soon after that, 61, Goa happened. 62, many crucial meetings were held by the prime minister and the, and the defense minister, which is the army chief and the chief of general staff, Biji Call and, and Pallet and others. No Air Force, no Air Navy. Okay, okay, Navy was not required in the North. But any, even then, should have been there. Can you contribute somewhere? Right. And maybe the Navy could have come out with some solution, but at least, at least in terms of uh, the Air Force should have been there right from the beginning, every meeting. They weren't there. And then we say we didn't use the Air Force. Or the Air Force didn't have anything because the intelligence. So, quite frankly, this coordination between the services has been missing for a long time. And I don't think we even got over it today. And uh, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know. The theater command, certainly the way they're talking is not the answer. Because we don't have the assets to distribute under command. We still have to find a way of coordinating. Joint planning, in my opinion, is far more important. The first step towards joint operation. Unless you plan together, how will you fight together? Yeah, so I think appreciating the capabilities of the other services and planning to use those capabilities and then trusting that those capabilities will come through. I think these three need to be built up uh, you know, through a series of confidence building measures almost. Yeah, you should. I mean, once you operate together in exercises and people know what you're capable of, trust can be built up, but plan. Yeah. yeah the plans have to be joined. And each one fits in beautifully, you know, in a coordinated manner. You were an instructor in Staff College. Uh, did the yeah. did inter-service planning, was that very commonly taught at Staff College? Yes, yes, we did all that. To be honest, every exercise the joint exercise that we had, uh, we did together, uh, Navy, Army, Air Force. And I still remember as an Air Force guy calculating mule loads for, for the Army guy, you know, <laughs> so how many mule loads. I still remember that. With the Navy guy, funny. So we used to talk about why don't you use helicopters, why are you worrying about, oh, sometimes the weather, sometimes, but we, you know, in 80, I did the work in Top College in 82. We didn't have those kind of assets at that time, I suppose. So, not a short asset. So, they used to talk about new loads and calculate tables and things like that. And the, I still remember one exercise uh, where the Navy guy, uh, you know, we were talking about some planning and joint, uh, some, some particular operation. And he said, um, um, we need two aircraft carriers. So, I said, no, you don't. So, he looked at me again, same typical that the Air Force wants to scuttle our aircraft carriers. <laughs> I told him, I said, idiot, you need three, right? Because if you want to put two aircraft carriers, one in the east and one in the west, two carriers out, you need three because one will always be under refit, maintenance, something or the other. Then, then he looked at me and said, yeah, you're right. <laughs> so I said, you know, this is the way we should be talking. We, we think it's a zero-sum game. Uh, that if I take away, I mean, if he doesn't get something, I will get it. No, that's not the way it happens. It's... It's total capability of the three services that you have to build together. Like, like within the army, you would, if you neglect artillery or armor or, or one pretty, or signals or bridge or engineers, you, you can have all the infantry in the world, right? But if you don't have the supporting arms, you won't get anywhere. So it depends on the situation and what, what should be emphasized and how you use them. Just like that, I mean, the Navy and the Air Force, you know, together. Very true, sir. Right, so of course we used to talk about it a lot, but I know there are some books now which are which have come out lately, which talk about uh, lack of vision, like the Wellington syndrome, and a couple of books like that have come out. I don't know whether you read them. They talk about that you know people are not uh, thinking enough and stuff. Or the freedom is not given. It's only DS solution. I know in our time we had changed the exercises. I remember the, uh, the training team also, and we used to encourage original thinking and solutions. We used to think like that. We used to at least let people say, all right, whatever, convince. I mean, you have a logical answer to a particular problem that we've given you, well, go ahead and say right. it. Doesn't matter. And the more controversial, the better. We used to encourage that. Yep. Wonderful. So, our college is just the beginning. I think we should be doing more together. 
Well, sir, we've taken almost uh, two hours of your time. I'm really very, very grateful to you today for just been absolutely fascinating. Can't thank you enough. Uh, and uh, we look forward to, you know, sharing links to your articles as well as, uh, you know, to some of the uh, artifacts and materials that you had spoken about. But again, thank you for your service and thank you for uh, all the time that you spent with us today. Thank you, Gans. Pleasure being with you. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. I know I certainly did. There are a few points that the Air Marshal made that I want to draw your attention to, but before that, just wanted to clarify what he meant when he said 350 or 270 or 240. So pilots generally talk in terms of degrees on the compass and 0 or 360 is north and therefore 090 is east, 180 is south, 270 is west and so on and so forth. So when he says I steered a heading of 350, that's about 10 degrees uh, left of the northerly heading. And uh, so that's how you can understand that particular terminology. Uh, he also mentioned something about how every branch contributed to his success. Engineering, accounts, the maintenance staff, the radar staff, forward air controllers, photo interpreters. A modern Air Force is a complex machine and everybody contributes to the success. Although it's only the fighter pilots or the bomber pilots who actually put themselves in danger by crossing over into uh, enemy territory. I'm also struck in all these conversations by how none of these folks think of themselves as heroes. They were just doing the job they were trained for. They were focused on doing that job as professionally as they could and on not letting the team down. They never thought of themselves as doing anything heroic and they didn't expect any reward in return. I was also fascinated by the implications and impact of accuracy and timing. He said the second mission was due to arrive over Thais Gaon two minutes later and how you know you have to be at the highest level of your professional game to be able to operate with that level of accuracy and precision to make sure everything goes like clockwork and that's the sort of professionalism that's demanded of anyone in the military in general but I think military aviators in particular. Lastly, I think, you know, we mentioned General Sagat Singh a lot and I would urge anybody who uh, finds that interesting, uh, there are several books that have been written about 71 operations uh, and you should look them up, read up those articles and uh, discover more about some of these folks that otherwise we don't uh, know much about. Well, folks, that's all we have time for this week. Join us again next week. In the meantime, sign up for updates at blueskiespodcast.com. There you'll find links to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. You can also write to us with your comments, questions, suggestions and feedback from the website or to blueskies at prganapati.com. Subscribe to the podcast on any podcasting platform such as Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts and even on YouTube. If you like what you heard, Share it with your friends, give us a rating in your favorite podcasting app and write us a review. It will help other people find us. I want to give my thanks to Saurav Chaudhya for our logo and Prithvik for the music. I want to reiterate that all the views expressed here are personal and this podcast has not been approved by or reviewed by the Air Force, Ministry of Defense or any branch of the government. In the meantime, stay safe. And Jay Hind. <laughs>